So tonight we'll be on lesson two of our series on zeal. Lesson three will be set out in the lobby at the end of class. It's all printed. Um, that will be sent out tomorrow as well. So if you're comfortable doing the digital, that's great. There's about 45 printed copies. So if you're good at doing the digital, just don't take a printed copy, please. Uh, that way people who need the printed copy can get one. And if there's extras by Wednesday night, go ahead and feel free to take one. Uh, like I've been saying, uh, in this class, I know we took a week break. Whatever we get through tonight, we get through. The lesson is meant for us to study at home, really rack our brains, dig through it, and then when we come together, it's to discuss the material, focus on application, additional insights, questions, that kind of stuff. So tonight we're going to be looking at building a spiritual fire, because again, this is what drives zeal. Uh, before we get started, we do want to go to God in word of prayer, and Ron, would you lead us in that word? For the love you've shown us, this beautiful earth that you've created for us, the scriptures that guide our lives, your wonderful son Jesus, who sacrificed so much so that we could have our sins forgiven. We pray tonight for Dixie Ballman who's suffering in the hospital. And Alice is going to have a pacemaker this week. Would you please watch over her, too? We're going to study tonight from your word, Father, and examine carefully the scriptures, and we hope our lives will be improved by the things we learn here tonight. Please bless us and Watch over us. Forgive us of the things we do wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, that should be right. So kind of go over some concepts we covered last time, all those many two weeks ago. Our English word zeal really comes from a family of words in, in the Greek which at one point meant uh, being on fire or a fervent heat. And so zeal carries this idea of being on fire for God. And we, we touched on many of that last time. It's a, it's a passion for God that consumes the individual. Is their every desire and every waking moment. And we talked about last time how this is more about, this is not so much a feeling, although zeal can be accompanied by feelings such as joy and and, and so forth, but there's more of attitude and a mindset. You know, we, we talked about how, you know, I'm, I'm naturally an introvert. That's just how I am, so I don't experience the highs and lows of emotions. If I have a really good piece of chocolate cake, I'm like, yeah, this is good. It's just kind of, it is what it is. Uh, so when it comes to my passion for God, it doesn't look the same as, say, Brett's or Chris's. Um, we, we talked about, I mentioned Brent Phillips this morning. He's one that gets so animated and passionate when he's teaching. I, I don't get that way. It doesn't mean that our passion or zeal for God is not uh, equally as strong. It's just we experience things differently. So I want to say it because sometimes when we talk about zeal, we, we make the mistake of thinking it's, it's something emotional. If I'm not on fire and, and you know, going out and trying to preach every single individual, then somehow I'm failing as a Christian, and that's not the case. Zeal looks different for each person. Um, beginning, getting tonight, building fire. So I want to start off with physical fire. Let's just think about that for a moment. What does it take to start a physical fire? Oxygen. Okay. Takes oxygen. Well, what is oxygen for a fire? Accelerant. It's accelerant. It's a, it, it's a fuel. Okay. What else does it take to start a fire? Okay, fuel, heat, oxygen. So normally it's, there, there's a heat, you know, if you're doing the really hard old way that I've never been able to start a fire by, uh, it's, you take, a one, you take one piece of wood that has a little hole in it, and you're taking another smaller piece of wood, and you're rubbing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until that, that heat generates enough friction to catch fire, and it's eating that oxygen. Spiritually, 
there's a similarity. Uh, zeal, if it's a fire, also depends upon the right source of heat, the right kind of fuel, and the right source or the right kind of environment. Um, Philip, Philip Shoemaker and uh, Lifelong Zeal, I put it up there, I realize it's, I'm going to read it. He had this to say, and I thought it was very applicable. He said, when all three of these components are together in sufficient quantities, a chain reaction takes place, and a fire will naturally ignite. If any of these elements are taken away, the fire will just as naturally die out. The combination of heat, fuel, and air is God's formula for fire. Similarly, the spiritual fire of your zeal also depends on bringing together the right source of heat, the right kind of fuel, and the right kind of environment. Equally, it's true that if any of those things are lacking or missing in the equation, zeal will not happen. And if all those are in existence in, your, in, in abundance, zeal will be a natural reaction to those ingredients. It's not the right word I'm looking for, but it conveys the point. So let's, let's talk about some of this tonight. There's going to be some discussion questions along the way. The first one in, in the lesson was more just for personal reflection. That one we're not going to talk about, just because, again, it's, it's more of a self-examination, a self-assessment, assessment, excuse me. Think about what components of zeal that you are lacking, what do you need the most, what do you need to improve upon. Really encourage you to still fill that out, maybe talk with the members of your household, talk to another Christian here about that. Um, because that's how you can perhaps figure out where you need to work on this. But hopefully along the way, you'll, we'll figure out, you know, what are we lacking, where do we need to grow, and so forth. So, the first thing we need to build fire is heat. So the right heat source for a Christian, well, who wants to venture a guess what the right heat source for a Christian is? Dave? The word. the word of God, from God himself. Yes. So the right heat source then, we can talk about God, who has given us his word. So we have a perfect motivation, perfect example to motivate us to be zealous for God. Consider Romans chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 6. Romans 5 and 6, and we're going to go through verse 11. Paul says here, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we were so for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we, ha we have now received the reconciliation. So God has already provided us the ample motivation for why we should be zealous for him. In that he, in he, when he didn't have to, provided a sacrifice for our sins. When he would be absolutely just and morally right to say, no, you always have sinned. You, by the divine law, there's no reason why I should grant pardon of any kind. You are worthy of, of death, per the guilt of the punishment of sin. But he demonstrates his own love, as Paul says there in Romans 5, that he sends forth his son to die on the cross innocently so that he might reconcile his enemies to himself. And really this is a point where when we think about, it's probably a good point to th ask ourselves and think about what, it, what really is my motivation for being a Christian. Because there's, there, there's a lot of different motivating factors in being a Christian. I would say some of them have their place, some of them don't have their place. Some of them are a starting point but they, should not sustain, they cannot sustain you long-term when it comes to zeal. I'm going to throw some of those up on the board. 
But Phil, Philip Shoemaker again has this to say. I thought it was a really good quote. He said, lifelong zeal cannot be built upon self-serving desires or even the passion of others. And this kind of gets embodied in the, in the saying that God has no grandchildren. He only has children. That is, you don't get to be born into a relationship with God. You don't just get to inherit the zeal and the faith of your fathers. It has to be personal. It has to be owned. Um, I remember my friend telling me that, you know, he grew up in the church. And for a long time, you know, he would read his Bible. He'd do his Sunday school lesson and everything. It just it wasn't personal. He was just doing what he was supposed to be doing, quote, unquote. And everybody thought, you know, he's such a great Christian. You know, he's showing up. He's doing Bible class, all that stuff. He said it wasn't until he got a brand new Bible, I think, when he was 15 or 16, that he finally took some colored pencils and highlighters, whatever he could find, and actually started digging in to the scriptures he already had known. And at that point, he said he made it personal, that the zeal, the fire had finally caught. Um, so he, he, in that process, he examined, what actually is my motivation? Am I following, am I being a Christian because mom and dad told me to? Am I being a Christian because this is the message that I, I truly believe this, and I, this is my life? So here are some not-so-great motivations. Fear. Now, the old-time preachers did a lot of good. But a lot of time, what ended up happening is they scared people into the baptistry. And that fear, fear might be a good starting point. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I was fearful of a lot of things and what, that was part of the driving force of why I wanted to investigate the claims of Christ. But fear can't sustain you. It puts you in a fight or flight response in your body. The medical science has shown if you, if you, have to, if you stay in that situation, that, that physical response for too long, it, start, it starts causing physical damage to your body. You cannot sustain it. And it creates a very unhealthy view of God if your only motivation to serving him is out of fear. It creates this a false god, a little g-god that is a despot who's looking for somehow to, to get you. So fear would not be, I would say, it's not a good motivation to sustain you as a Christian. It might be a good starting point, but we've got to grow beyond that. Secondly, Reputation? You know, in the 50s and 60s, it was considered the socially acceptable thing to do, the good thing to do, the American thing to do, to join a church, to be active in the church. It didn't matter what kind of church, you just had to be active. That was part of the, that was part of the image. So one might join, you know, a church by, in, the, in downtown that the bankers attend. That way you can make connections for your jobs. Some may do it for that. Others, they're, they're motivated by practicality. That is, well, this, this moral teaching, it just works for me. It's, it's, I've, I've, I've surveyed all the different religions, and this one I kind of like. I get along with it, and it just, it just works. It, it's, a, it's a very utilitarian view of Christianity, not the heart of Christianity. That won't sustain a person. Really, the only motivation that we can have and the only motivation that will sustain us, the only motivation that will be the fire within us for zeal is love. Consider 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18 for a moment. I'm going to get through this and we'll get to one of the discussion questions so I can be quiet and we can start discussing these concepts. First uh, John chapter four and verse eighteen. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Now I think that we could we could go back to Romans five if we wanted to talk about that, but love should be the motivation. Um, so I want to actually get ahead to the, this question here. I've, I've talked enough. Think about the attributes of God. What attributes of God most excite you? Or what has really helped you develop a deep love for him? So let's start with the first one. What attributes of God excite you, um, are motivations for you? What attributes keep you going, encourage you, 
Well, how else do you want to phrase that? Ron and then Berna. Ron? Beautiful place called Heaven. Okay. Where there's no sorrow, no sickness, and no. So God's faithfulness to his promise of heaven? Yes. Berna? If I weren't able to talk to God, I couldn't survive. Matthew, repeat that first part, sorry. I said that God is always there for you. Mm. If I didn't have God, I couldn't survive if I couldn't talk to him every single day. So God constantly being there, being steadfast, faithful. We talked about that a couple months ago. God is faithful. He is always there. What other attributes or characteristics of God? Barbara? He's merciful. Merciful. We see that when we see our prayers answered. Mm -hmm. Merciful, Jim, and then we'll get to Chuck. The real basic fundamental is the beauty of his creation mm -hmm. and the fact that he created the heavens and the earth, and we can't even imagine what heaven could be like. It's right, he has shown himself in the creation, and, it, and the creation pales in comparison to what heaven will be like. Chuck and then Zach. No variance from God, like we were told about Jesus, the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. God's word never changes. It's always the same. <clears throat> so there's no var variability with God. He, he is dependable. He is steadfast and <laughs> the same. Zach? Uh, without his grace and without his patience for us, um, there's just nothing for us. And that's kind of an ultimate example mm -hmm. for us on uh, how we should treat others. And um, as humans, we're, we're eager to nitpick how others do, do things. And uh, that's an ultimate example that without his grace and without his patience, uh, there's nothing for us. Right. I really appreciate what Zach had to say here. And I'll get to Hannah and then Chris. Um, is for me, grace is the big motivator. Uh, because as I grow as a Christian, I become more conscious of my own shortcomings, my own failures, my own sins, the stuff that besets me constantly on a daily basis. And I have to remind myself that God's grace is the great motivator. It is the great debtor. Um, there's a reason why Amazing Grace has, I believe, ten lyrics to it. They're not all tenor in our hymn book, but there's a reason why you could go on and on talking about the grace of God. Hannah and then Chris. Um, the act of care God shows for us, he didn't just create us and leave us. He actually cares for each of us individually. So the act of care of God, he cares for us, each of us individually. He didn't, he, he didn't like the deists, you know, believe that he just kind of created everything and just left it going and he walked away. No, he is actively caring for us. Chris? Yeah, I, I agree with the way everybody's saying there too. And it, another one that I think of and I think of often is, is pain. Mm. I remember us here in, in their, their diligent way to, to they try to serve the Lord every day, understanding how, how they should be and, and just watching them from afar is, is a big point. All right, Steve and Tom. Uh, I would say is love. Because to be honest, growing up, until I had read the Bible, I don't think I really understood what love was. Mm -hmm. But as I watched God's, how God dealt with people, his, his unbelievable patience, uh, and the fact that he was always willing to take the first step, I didn't understand that love is a very active word. So God's love. You know, people go to school for years and years and years to get a medical degree or an engineering degree, and then they specialize in a certain aspect of the medical field, you know, some specialize in the eye or the ears, nose. God knows all of that. He knows that and stuff that we can't even begin to comprehend that he knows. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, God's all knowledge definitely is just, you know, as Tom was saying, people spend decades of their lives focusing on one specific field of knowledge and yet God already knows that he knows it all and that should be more motivation to serve him Paul uh, building on what Tom said uh, God doesn't just know everything he has all the answers and he's willing to share those answers mm -hmm. right? he's he's told us all the answers to all the questions that matter 
And he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have everything we need to know. And that, if that's not something to be excited about, I don't know what is. And that's something we need to be sharing, right? We have all the answers. They're right here. You can read the answers with me. Right. And Paul was picking back off of what Tom had said, is that not only does he know everything, but he has given us the answers we absolutely need. And he has given us in such a way that we can plunge the depths of Scripture to find those answers. And to me, the amazing thing, piggybacking off of both of those, is it doesn't matter if you have studied the Scriptures two years, 20 years, if even if you had 150 years to plunge the depths of scriptures, there's still more to learn. Um, there is still another insight to be gained and their application to make. Chuck, and we'll move on. Fear is not a bad thing. We're told God is a God of vengeance. And he tells us, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, it's a terrible thing fall the hands of the living God, but we understand also his mercy, so that alleviates the fear that we have of his vengeance on us in that final day. Mm -hmm. Great point. All right. So God is the ultimate motivation. He's that perfect heat source to generate that motivation, that, that spark for zeal. But as, as something that Steve said, God makes the first move. Mankind didn't actively send a letter to God and say, hey, we really need a savior. You know, God, from the very beginning, was showing mankind, like, hey, you guys need a savior. And he's, he's making that first step repeatedly. You see that in the Old Testament, you see in the New Testament. That savior being Christ Jesus, um, he's the perfect fuel, the, the character of Christ. I like what, again, Shoemaker had to say here. Lifelong zeal is fueled in your heart when you put on the character of Christ. Just as you build up a campfire with additional logs, every trait of Christ you adopt will expand and enhance your zeal. This is great news because the many positive traits of Christ present limitless ways to enhance your zeal. You can easily spend a lifetime growing more like him. The thing is, that this is the work of sanctification, this ongoing process of becoming more like Christ. And this will continue on until the day we die. And I believe there's a reason why God does this slowly. Uh, because God in his infinite power could have instantaneous, the day you become a Christian, max sanctification. Done. But he didn't. And I think it's because if he did, there might be some room for one of us humans to be prideful and both say, no, I, I, I did that. So God sanctifies us slowly in order to teach us our utter dependence upon him. That we need him and we need to grow, we need to work on these. Plus, a more practical argument, too, is that there's a lot to work on on me. And I'm not sure I can do it all at the same time, so I need to work on little bit, little bit, bit by bit. Anyway, so getting to the, one of the next questions here, is what character traits would you advise uh, that young people develop that have really helped you maintain your zeal? Um, so, think if you're giving advice to a new Christian, what character traits of Christ we find in the Bible uh, would you recommend a young Christian actively pursue that have really helped you maintain your zeal? Chuck? I think the one thing that helps me the most, and I'm going to quote from Proverbs 24, it says, The righteous fall seven times and rises again. We have to make our young people understand that there is failure in life, but that's not the end of life. We've all faced failure in our life, but we have to remain strong, especially as Christians. I've seen so many, well, people that get devastated by the faith in life and they cannot overcome it. We have to accept the things that overtake us in life and learn to be strong. Right. The scripture reference that Chuck uh, brought up was Proverbs 24 and verse 16. For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. So a character trait I think I can distill from that is perseverance. 
uh, really teaching the young people, all of us, that we need perseverance if we're going to maintain our, our zeal. Lynn, you had something? Well, I just work on your belief, work on your faith, because I think that that, a lot of times, pretty much what Chuck just said, really, it, it helps you persevere, because, and I'll think about it. <laughs> no, I think you're on to something there. Uh, made the point of work on your faith, make it your own, and I remember reading a little quip from Floyd Thompson in that book, book, chapter, and verse. Talking about in, in Romans, where Paul talks about my glorious gospel, or my gospel. Floyd said, I knew, he said, I, I think I know brethren well enough that if Paul around today, some would take offense at that, that he said, it's my gospel. Um, okay, we all know it's Christ's gospel, it's God's gospel, but Paul's attitude should be our attitude. We should identify so personally be so plunged into the depths of Scripture. Yeah, it is my gospel. It is, I, I believe this. It is mine. I, I have taught it. I believe it. I study it. It's, it's mine. It's, I, it's my most prized treasure. And so, bit off what Lynn, Lynn said, just, I would say maybe a character trait of that is diligence and study. I think would be a good one. Hannah, you had something? Understanding the why, why you are a Christian, why you believe Jesus is the Son of God, why you believe God created the earth, just understanding the why of your own foundation of right. the faith. Um, it's that way if you are faltering or questioning, you can always go back to that. Right, knowing the why. And I'll say on this, when I first became a Christian, after I, I, I think I've, it's been maybe a year since I've used this illustration, but... Um, I think I told you I all had my own crisis of faith my sophomore year in college. I got thrown with document, doc, document hypothesis, the Bible can't be inspired, all that stuff. So I plunged, uh, I, I dove deep into apologetics, like, okay, it's either I figure out the answer to this or that's it. Um, and in the moments of doubt through that, and the few occasionally after that, I go back to the whys, what are the facts? Okay, I know the tomb's empty. I know the Bible is inspired for reason one, two, three, four, five. And when you do that, it, it's kind of like, yeah, you're just in a mood right now. You're probably hungry, you need a nap, you know? Just, you know the facts, you know why. And that can be a really good motivator to keep on with your zeal. What are character traits? What are things would you recommend young Christians develop? Zach and then Barbara. Uh, I had written down diligence that you had touched on earlier, and um, when you think about um, when you're a new Christian, a lot of what you know is the world, um, because you wake up and you survive, and then you go to sleep, and then you wake up the next day, and when you're thinking about worldly things like that, um, you set goals for yourself that have a time frame and are written down that you are held accountable for. Same thing, if you have uh, just a diligence and a responsibility about I'm going to set 6 p.m. every day for reading scriptures, um, slowly that leads into uh, it becoming habits. Right. Diligence is absolutely key because it's, it's by small, incremental changes every single day. Stuff you can't see in the, in the moment add up to mountains of change down the road. Barbara? Goal setting. I mean, we're taught in the Bible the ultimate goal is to reach heaven. But I think as young people, if they set little goals like this week I'm going to compliment one person or, you know, I'm, I'm going to do something nice for somebody this week. Just start setting those little goals. And again, reading your Bible, I'm going to read my Bible, you know, but write it down, set those goals, and achieve those goals. And then as you grow in the faith, your goals become more plentiful and bigger. Right. So Barbara had setting goals. That's a very good habit. That's a very good practice that very successful people are in and successful Christians are in. That's how you're able to measure your growth. And not these vague goals of like, I want to read the Bible more. Okay, that's a desire. It's a good desire. But a smart goal, it would be, 
I want, you know, my desire is I want to read the Bible more. So a smart goal would be, you need to be specific, it needs to be measurable, there needs to be a time frame to it, you need to have an action plan to it. So that would be, okay, every day, bouncing off of what Zach said, 6 p.m., I'm going to read for 30 minutes, and I'm going to start in the book of John. You know, there's a specific way to measure it. I can, I can see it was I successful or not on that. Um, and that will, again, help part of that perseverance and persistence of going through here. Uh, Ron, and then Brett, and then... Be honest with yourself. Yes. Do your due diligence, but when you find something you don't necessarily believe in, uh, and the facts are overwhelming, be honest. Don't, don't fool yourself. Right. Be honest with yourself. Um, one thing, when it comes to sin in your own life, one thing I heard that really just blows all the lies out of the water is you can't lie to God. God already knows how wretched you are and he loves you anyway. So admit your sin, repent of it, and move on because God already knows it. And he's waiting for you to do the right thing. Um, there was a hand over here with Brett and then Tony. Obviously everything said here is true, but there's some people, my experience is talking several, that come out of a very, very worldly life Mm -hmm. You need to remind them you're sanctified, you're justified, you're washed, and you can't work it. There's no way you're going to work off your sin. Right. And you're, you're already forgiven. And that helps them develop that love then because they came to it out of fear. Right. And we do work out our salvation. Absolutely. And my dad will allow them to be encouraged to see the love of God that he's done this for you. You're not going to work at all. And then it brings about towards that love and, and in terms of zeal in it, you desire it. Mm -hmm. Right. Huh? For young Christians is Psalm 1-1. One, one. It mm -hmm. says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I think so often, whether you're a young Christian or a not so young Christian, I mean, there is such a temptation just to, oh, I can dip my, my toe in sin. I can, this isn't going to bother me. I can, I can withstand this. And it is such a slippery slope. And especially for young people. I mean, they just, we just need to really focus on purity and, and surrounding ourselves with other Christians um, that have that same goal and the same mindset. Because, you know, minor things, I mean, it just, it just, rolls downhill so quickly. It does. There's a reason why the Hebrew writer uh, says in chapter 12 and verse 1, since there we, therefore, since we have such a great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Um, I think most of us have probably had the wired earbuds. Um, I know in high school we all had them, and you would be very careful to wrap them up where they wouldn't get tangled, and you put them in your pocket, and you're, you're guaranteed, you're like, okay, they're firmly in there, they're wrapped up nice, it's not going to get tangled. You breathe wrong, and you pull them out, and they're in knots, and they're tangled, and you just can't get them out. That's what sin does. And it's so easy, it happens so quickly, which serves, Tony's comment serves as a good transition um, to the next point. I'm going to rapid fire through this, so, okay, hang on. So these are some of the stuff we talked about. I do want to touch on these very quickly, and then we'll get to the right environment, which Tony touched on, which is purity. So some of the, these character traits, courage. If you don't have courage, zeal becomes paralyzed. Um, you consider energy. If you don't have it, zeal becomes worthless. Without diligence, that incremental change every day in pursuing God, zeal becomes disappointing. It's like trying to diet only one day a week and expecting monumental results. Not going to happen. Without, without wisdom, zeal becomes deadly. Um, and then loving service. Without, without loving service, zeal becomes a selfish pursuit. So, now on to the environment. Purity. So, it's hard to build 
zeal when you're, you're in an environment that's marred by sin. Likewise, uh, during this next monsoon season, which I'm hoping it's going to be a monsoon season, not a non-soon, but it'd be like during the next monsoon, I go outside, I'm going to try and start a fire in the middle of a monsoon. You don't have to tell me yes or no, but, you know, am I going to be very successful on that? No, I'm not. It's torrential downpour. It's not going to happen. So, I mean, I could use any other number of illustrations. It's like trying to clean yourself up in a, in a mud bath. It can't happen. And so if your environment is awful, it's sinful, marred with sin, you're going to have a hard time building that fire and keeping that fire going. And granted, we can't control everything. We can't control our environment 100%. I can't control what happens on the sidewalk and speedway. I can't control the fact that there's a brand new, or I can't control the fact that there's a Cold Stone, Baskin Robbins, and a Screamery on speedway over there, and I really like ice cream. I can't control that. What I can control is my route home. I can control what I think on, I can control me. I can control my responses. So, so far as it depends upon me, I need to strive for purity in every aspect of my life, knowing full well that temptation will come, but I need to make the good-hearted effort there. So, and there, the Bible does give us a balance. It does teach a balance between removing ourselves from the world to pursue purity and righteousness and holiness it's a balance between that and living completely in the world. There is a balance. So think on some of these scriptures just to consider. I'm going to throw them all up and we'll, we'll go through them. For example, Matthew 28 and verse 19, beginning the Great Commission. Jesus begins that with what? Go into all the world. Okay? That's pretty straightforward. We have to go into the world. Um, we, we look in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. Paul's correcting a misunderstanding. I'm going to paraphrase here, but he said, when I wrote to you not to associate with immoral people, I did not at all mean the immoral of the world. For then you would have to go out of the world. What I did mean is not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral, idolater, reviler, and he goes on and names the sins there. So Paul even says, okay, yeah, we, we have to associate with the world. We have to be in it. That's a given. But Paul, in the same letter, in first, same letter in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33, says, Be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And we want to turn to 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Paul says here, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So there is an absolute charge upon us to be separate, apart, holy and righteous, removed from the world. And then you have John, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 through 17, 17 excuse me, um, 15 through 17, um, 1 John Chapter 2, John writes here, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. That's pretty clear there, too. There's this balance that we have to strike between pursuing holiness with all of our might, but also still being in the world. And that touches on some of the stuff we said this morning. Christians are salt, distinct, but also preserving and uh, testifying to the world. Light is meant to be set on a hill, uh, set on a lampstand, that second similitude. That's separate, that's apart, but... It also gives light to all who are near it. So, the thing about some of these things then, it's discussed in how do we strike that balance um, in the time we have remaining. 
How does a Christian maintain a balance between living in the world and avoiding the world getting into them? What might be some practical things or to do or not to do, and, or what might it look like to have this balance? Ron? She was mentioning a minute ago as associated with Christians. Could be not just the people, but what you put into your head, like TV and what you read and Absolutely. what you watch on the internet. And I mean, we, we do need to teach other people a bit. So I feel like, but I no, but I understand what Tony and Brother Weber are saying. You know, you can't just immerse yourself with friends, only friends that are worldly, because that looks, you're right, that's a slippery slope, but, uh. <laughs> There is a balance. Yeah. And I think of, I think the balance is illustrated by the sign that used to be on the front door building at 18th and Burt Street where I grew up, that congregation. It's an old sign, they taped it to the front. I used to think it was the silliest thing on the planet, now I see there's a lot of wisdom in it. When you entered the building, the sign said, enter the worship. When you left, the sign said, leave to serve. And that's kind of, that's how it's just stuck with me. When we come together around other Christians, that's the time, if you'll allow me to say this, you can let your guard down, be relaxed. This is the time to be built up, to be encouraged, to be refreshed. The fact that we can assemble in these four walls and we don't have to worry about blatant profanity and all the other worldly things, it's a comfort, it's a release, it's relaxing. But we do this not for the sake of just, oh, I don't have to deal with worldly people. We come here to be re-energized, to go back out into the world, to be that salt and that light. Um, Zach, you have something? Uh, it's, it's good to associate with one another but we also have an example of Jesus where people were bewildered that he would even hang out with people of the world, with sinners. But in that example, it doesn't say that Jesus sinned. He didn't go get drunk with them and then sin. Uh, so it's very important going back to the beginning of this whole class that where we build our fire and how, how we lay our kindling and the, the basis of our life, we need to be prepared to be in the presence of others, um, not partake in their sin, um, and also know that uh, that one little spark is dangerous when we're hanging out with them. I worked um, the night the big horn fire caught, and our call center took over 400 calls just over probably 15 minutes of people that saw that fire. So understand that that spark is to be treated carefully and we need to make sure we build our fire on Jesus, on, on the word of God, and be ready to associate with the world, not just to close ourselves up. Right, a uh, little comment on that and we'll get to Caleb. Um, I, I've seen this in congregations Congregations that don't have a steady stream of new converts eventually start getting very nitpicky and very hostile. They don't like people that don't look like them. Silly stuff. Um, and they end up berating the few new converts they do get. I, I, I know I'm speaking in some generalities here, but I've seen this play out. Um, Meanwhile, congregations that do have a somewhat regular stream of new converts. Yes, back to what Brett said, these people are washed, they're sanctified, they're justified. But also, they're learning. And like a toddler who's trying to get a handle on how do these arms work and what am I supposed to do with this body, new Christians are the same way. They'll say things during prayers that you and I wouldn't, okay? We don't doubt the sincerity of their heart. They may wear, you know, they may not dress the most presentable way, but they're not earnest. They're like, okay, you know, you're learning. And they may let a few slang words out, 
or words that you and I would not say. But congregations are used to that. I'm not saying we become desensitized to it. We're like, you know what? They're learning, and we're here to help them. And this goes into what we're talking about is there is this balance. Congregations that have this influx of new converts understand the balance. We have to be pure. We have to be on fire for Jesus. But at the same time, we have to be reaching out to the world to bring people in, to bring people to Christ. And it, it teaches that balance of what is a hill to die on? When do you address certain topics? When do you actually deal with this? Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm taking enough time. Caleb, and then we'll have to wrap this class up. One of the things that strikes me best or most about the uh, maintaining this balance is why are we commanded to be a part of the world but separate from the world? We see in Matthew there, go into all the world making disciples. We're not really supposed to be friends. Our purpose is to be representatives of Christ, the salt of the earth or the salt of the world. And we're supposed to Go into the world and find those who will want to have a relationship with Christ. We're not supposed to get bogged down in the details. We're not supposed to be friends with the world. We're to draw them out of the fire, essentially, into the zeal of fire. Mm -hmm. And it's very important, like, we were, uh, going back to Jesus as the example. What was Jesus doing? He was spending time with them, teaching them. He was not, you know, he wasn't drinking, he wasn't out carousing with them. He was there as a representative, he was God in the flesh. He was teaching and preaching, and he was pulling them out of a life of sin and death and towards a life with eternal life as the end result. Right. And I want to offer this, and then we'll have to unfortunately bring this class to the close. A good way to strike the balance is, yes, we do need to associate with those in the world. We do need to be actively out there. Just let people know what you stand for. You don't, not obnoxiously, not rudely, not being ugly. Just very politely, as Paul said, teach the truth and love. Like, hey, you know, I, I, I don't do that. Um, or I don't appreciate, you know, the, the common ones. I'm, I don't appreciate you taking God's name in vain. You just let your wishes be known. And sometimes you don't have to say that. Uh, Paco can attest this. We were doing a meetup um, back in the before times. Um, and we had one lady. Uh, she had a mouth. But it's okay. She was earnest. Uh, because I'm not, I'm not justifying the mouth. None of us said anything. Because we're there trying to teach. That's what we're there, there for. After two or three meetups, she started catching herself. Oftentimes, being around salt and light has a very positive effect on people. Like, you, you start picking up. But anyway, it, it is a balance. And it, for each Christian, it's going to be a little bit different based on your maturity level. Uh, we can talk more on this. I think it will bleed well into next week. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about how do we avoid being lukewarm. Um, but that's a very, we touched some of that tonight. It's a very real thing. We want to avoid that. We need to be careful about that. Um, and so... Uh, with that, we're going to end the class, and I do want to spend a few moments discussing tonight, if anyone here is not yet.